welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Today we're covering John chapter 1 verses 35 to the end of the book. And the question I'm asking is what is the authentic view of Jesus? What in fact would you say the Jewish view of Jesus is? Now most I think would respond, Jewish people would respond by simply saying they reject Jesus, certainly at least as the Messiah or the Son of God. Just this year, a man I would consider almost a friend, a very respected Jewish academic, a professor at a local university with a deep knowledge and an interest in philosophy, who I meet with with others on a regular question to study such things, I asked him two questions. Question one was, could Jesus really be Israel's promised Messiah? His answer was no. He could not accept Jesus as the Messiah. No way. He was just a Jewish man, a great teacher probably, but someone who was arrested and killed by the Romans. Jesus, he said, was not supernatural or special in any way. He certainly didn't pre-exist. The concept he thought of a supernatural Jesus as the Messiah was developed by the writers of the New Testament, particularly Paul, who wanted to glorify him as God. I would add to that that he would reject all things supernatural, even spiritual, on the basis of a scientific background, but that's an aside. The second question I asked him is, do you believe that Jesus in any way fulfilled any of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah, even if you don't accept him as God? The answer he gave was no again. Jesus did not fill any of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Jesus was not in any way special. He was simply a man. He was not God. He said, I know that the New Testament teaches that Jesus, uh, this idea that Jesus was came and made an atonement for a man's sin, but in his view, that was ridiculous, almost blasphemous from a Jewish point of view, that a, a good man would be allowed to die for the sins of others. So that is one person's view of Jesus. Now that's one that he's reached by coming at from what he believes is an academic point of view. But is that the ordinary Jewish person's view of Jesus? Well, I believe that most Jewish people, and here's the thing, most Christian people, and certainly virtually everyone, certainly in this part of the West where I live, assume that is the case also, because they all make the base, some basic assumptions and several things about Jesus. Their starting point for most people today is that Jesus is not the Messiah of the Bible. They reject it, they see the Jews reject it, and they don't bother to investigate what the Bible says or what even Jesus had to say. In many cases, they won't even discuss it beyond the fact they think they maybe know that he might have been a historical figure and some would even contest that. But don't get me wrong, these views affect everyone. Christians, Jews, Muslims, everyone. But an underpinning position is that perhaps allows many people to reach this point. One of the factor is they see the Jews rejecting Jesus Christ and as a result they don't even want to think about it. And I would say it also affects Christians in the fact they tend not to try and engage with Jewish people about their Christian faith. Christians also assume that Jewish people know lots about the Bible, which in my experience they generally do not. So what I'd like to do this morning is a little bit different. It's talk about something that's not often discussed by Christians. I'd like to talk about the real Jesus and the real Jewish aspect of Jesus's life and what that means. So welcome to today's episode of the Bible Project Daily Podcast. this morning we're coming to a passage that covers two days again 
this time two days in the life of Christ. Yesterday we looked at two days, but they were in the life of John the Baptist. However, we see at the end of chapter 1, we're given two successive days in the life of Christ. In verse 35 to 42, we see one day in which Jesus calls two men to be his disciples. And then in verses 43 to the close of the chapter, verse 51, we're given the events of the next day in which two more men are called as his disciples. Therefore, in the passage, the whole passage today, we have an account of the first four men who become the disciples of Christ. Now, I'd like to point out before we even start that these four men were definitely Jewish. And these four men would all later become followers of Christ. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit here. So let's go back to the beginning and start by reading from verse 35. The next day... John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who was following Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was find his brother, Simon, and tell him, We have found the Messiah. This is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You, Simon, son of John, you will be called Caiaphas, which is translated as Peter. Now, as this story opens today, John the Baptist is still the central figure in the narrative. But on this particular day, we see we, he has with him two of his disciples. Now, these two disciples are not named here, as we're reading it initially, but one of them is identified later. In verse 41, he says, One of the two who heard John speaking and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, the second disciple is never named in this passage, but I have to say that most Bible expositors and commentators have concluded that, in fact, the second man was John himself, the author of this gospel we're reading. Now, I'll not go into all the technicalities as to why they've concluded that, but I would say the evidence is substantial, and I agree with that. But just to say this, this account was given by an eyewitness, therefore it stands to reason from just a common sense point of view that the, the second disciple it was very likely John, the writer of the one who's witnessing and taking account of what's going on. So imagine the scene, if you will, John the Baptist standing with two of his disciples, a man at that point called Andrew and this other guy called John, and as they're standing with him, they notice Jesus Christ is approaching. And in verse 36, John the Baptist, looking at Jesus as he's walking towards him, says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now the word translated look is much more than just a momentary glance. This word means a deep, intense stare. If you will, John sees Jesus coming and he stops and he stares at them along with the others as if they're wanting to examine him, penetrate him and understand him in some way with their gaze. Now they would have seen Jesus on that day clearly as just a contemporary Jewish man. He would have had sandals like everybody else. So this makes the declaration all the more starting. You see, I'm sure when they looked at him, they wouldn't have seen anything particularly unusual in his appearance that would lead them to make this, John the Baptist, to make this dramatic statement. There's no halo over his head, like a medieval picture. There's no crown on his head, and he's certainly not surrounded by angels. This would have just looked like an ordinary man on that day approaching them. But John the Baptist still chooses very dramatically to say, Behold, the Lamb of God. And that declaration speaks volumes to these two guys. You see, these two disciples are Jewish, and they would have known what that meant. The lamb was an integral part of their religious practice. They knew because they themselves would have taken lambs to the tabernacle, to the temple in their day, and sacrificed them as a picture of the covering for their sin. 
They would have also been familiar with the Jewish Passover, where they remembered how Moses took a lamb and killed it and took the blood of the lamb and sprinkled it on doorposts so that sin would be covered and a holy God could pass it by. They would have also been well aware that one day God had said he would send his lamb to sacrifice for sin. Isaiah chapter 53 talked extensively about that and they would have been familiar with that. So in this particular day, what they see and understood is that John the Baptist, the man that they're following, is saying to them that this man, Jesus, approaching them on this day is God's sacrifice for sin. Well, needless to say, that gets their attention. And we're told in verse 7 that the two disciples hear him say this and they immediately begin to follow Jesus. Jesus then becomes aware of the fact that they're coming along after him. And that's why we see in verse 38, he turns to them and says to them, what do you want? Or is perhaps better translated by some, of the original translations, what is it that you seek? In other words, it's a deeper level. He's saying, what is it you really want? Why are you following me? And they say, Rabbi, which means basically teacher. And as an aside, at this point, they're definitely recognizing him as a teacher. So you must remember that these disciples a few moments ago were disciples of John the Baptist and John refers them to Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Messiah. So at this point, we can't 100% for sure know at this point that they've fully accepted him because they're only addressing him as teacher. They at least give John credit for that much. Rabbi, which is the term they address Jesus by, is translated as teacher. Some would say maybe even master, someone that you're wanting to follow to learn on. But they ask him, where is it that you're staying? And what they're saying in that is obviously, we want to come and see you and be with you where you are. We want to spend, well, at least a day with you and we want to talk. That's obviously what's in their mind, because verse 39, we see his reply to them. He simply says, well, come and see. And it tells us they went with him and where he was staying and they spent time with him. And because of an earlier time key given in the passage, we will know that they probably likely spent the whole day with him, beginning at 10 in the morning, going through to 4 in the afternoon. The bottom line is these guys have been told by someone they followed and respected, someone they probably saw as a bit of an authority figure, this John the Baptist, that this person was the promised Lamb of God. But at the point in which they heard that, they were interested, they followed him, but it wasn't quite enough for the two men to accept it fully. And I would say that was because one of them was this guy called Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, we don't have a huge amount of information in the Bible about Andrew, but from the passages we have, we can paint a sort of picture. We can assume some things about this guy. And I would say by looking at the different references to him, we can see he was definitely an analytical sort of fellow. He may probably have been rather shy as well, some commentators say. Now, a way of describing him that I found helpful was someone said, you know there are people who are, when presented with a sales pitch, will buy now and think later. Well, Andrew, he's certainly not that type of person. When he's presented with a sales pitch, he's the type of person who would automatically, by his nature, say, hold on a minute. I have a few questions. This is a type of man who is by nature cautious, but conscientious at the same time, probably quite conservative. So this is the type of person who is really difficult to pull the wool over their eyes. Because even if that person appears to be offering something he needs, he's going to ask a hundred questions before he makes his decision. But once Andrew was convinced, he fully believed, and we see he will immediately share what he's discovered with Peter. Now, Peter, in contrast, he didn't need a whole day of asking questions of Jesus. When Andrew told him about finding the Messiah, Peter promptly went 
himself to see Jesus, and on meeting Peter, Jesus immediately looked at him and renamed him Cepheus, meaning the rock, a stone, signifying a transformation through a recognition of Peter's character, and for him it was immediate. Now John doesn't provide much detail here, but elsewhere in the Gospel accounts, we learn more about Peter's journey and how he came to fully recognise Jesus as the Messiah. Basically, it boils down to Jesus asking Peter, confronting him very early on and saying, who do you say I am? And Peter almost immediately responding, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So you can't fail to see the, how this passage highlights two very different Jewish men, first century Jewish men, coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah of the Old Testament. One, Andrew, the cautious inquirer, and Peter, the impulsive, immediate uh, responder and believer. But both reached the same conclusion, and both reached that conclusion through personal encounters with Jesus. And I have to say, as an aside, since then, countless Jewish individuals have followed in their footsteps simply by daring to, to look at Jesus, to meet with him, and thereby recognising him as the Messiah. In fact, in our country and around the world, there are organisations made up of people primarily of Jewish heritage, all of whom are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Within our nation, our group, of people and churches who identify themselves as messianic jews there's even a group called jews for jesus i believe they operate in the us as well and around the world and they'll readily tell you that they are jewish people who believe and accept jesus as messiah in fact they describe themselves as a group of people who have come to believe that jesus is the messiah of israel in their press release they write right we believe that the new testament and the old testament both are true we believe in one true god and that the godhead is fully revealed in the person of jesus christ furthermore we believe and accept that the god of abraham isaac and jacob made us jews by physical birth hence we call ourselves jews for jesus in a recent newspaper article an interview i read and the reporter asked, how is it possible for Jews to believe in Jesus Christ? Aren't Judaism and Christianity mutually exclusive? I like the leader of Jews for Jesus' answer in the UK when he said, there are some today who, because of ignorance and prejudice, promote that idea that we can only be one or the other, but that is simply not true. For it requires a very narrow definition of a Jew and a Christian, he said, and none of the early disciples renounced their Jewishness at any point. Their understanding as Jews was that he was the promised Messiah of Israel and they will give many scriptural texts to justify their belief. Now the point I'm making here is that many Jewish people, many people of different faiths have come to believe Jesus is the Messiah and they did that simply after making the choice to look at him and listen to him. Therefore, what I'm saying really, I suppose, is if you have friends who are Jewish in background, if you have a chance, simply encourage them to read, and I would recommend the Gospel of Matthew. And if they simply do that, they may indeed find out something and see something quite extraordinary. The authority of Jesus's word from an authentic first century Jewish context, completely authentic to the biblical Old Testament voice they are familiar with. So the question of how can a Jewish person today come to such a conclusion after being taught all their life that Jesus is not for the views, well I'm simply saying it's the same way as it's always been, the same way as it's described here which is going to be again illustrated for us in another way in the second day of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ when he speaks to two more individuals and by examining their stories as well we can conclude that anyone from any background can come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Saviour of anyone in the world. The text continues, verse 43 says, 
The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? he replied. Can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, He truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked Jesus. I saw you while you were under the fig tree, before Philip even called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, You believe? Because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he added, Very truly I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, on first reading, it seems like Philip almost comes to the Lord without any other person or any, anything really being involved in it. However, I believe, as others do, that Andrew and Peter had probably approached Philip first and planted a seed, if you will. John emphasises, in his Gospel account, we are able to pull together the fact that these guys came from the same city, suggesting that Andrew and Peter likely had an opportunity to speak to Philip before he'd even met Jesus. And this is supported by verse 45, where Philip finds Nathaniel and says, We have found him. So he did not say I, he said we. So he's including himself with Andrew and Peter. And he's saying he's found him, someone that they've talked about probably in the past. So this is illustrating a chain reaction, a chain of events, a domino effect, where we're seeing one person's belief leading to another's. Now, in the overall passage that we've looked at today, we're seeing a sequence of testimonies and discoveries of how people have found and understood who Jesus is. First, John the Baptist, he testifies about him as the Lamb of God. Then Andrew, who after meeting Jesus, finds his brother Peter, and Peter and Andrew subsequently, it seems, have planted the seed with Philip. So let's just take a look at Philip. Well, there's not a lot to go on, but from the glimpses we have here of him in the New Testament, it's clear that Philip is very different from the impetuous Peter. Philip is a steady, stable, cautious, analytical, a bit like Peter perhaps in these days. But Philip seems to be someone who himself has just a small group of close friends. And it is this stable, steady, maybe even studious man that Jesus comes to and says, follow me, meaning take a journey with me. And Philip's conclusion is revealed in the passage when he says to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So this indicates that Philip concluded that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and he did reach that conclusion and he was convinced by primarily reading the Jewish scriptures. He believed that Jesus fulfilled the role prophesied there. Now let's look at Nathaniel's response. Now interestingly, his name, this guy by name, isn't mentioned in any of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark or Luke. But from this little conversation with Philip, we can glean some things about Nathaniel's personality. When Philip told him he'd find the Messiah, Nathaniel skeptically asked, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, this skepticism may have stemmed from several factors. He knew, of course, because of his studious nature, that the Messiah was prophesied to come from Bethlehem. Nazareth was an obscure, unmentioned village in the Old Testament. It might even be there was likely some local rivalry between his town and the town of Nazareth nearby. Now Philip, he responds to Nathaniel's initial scepticism by simply saying, come and see. And then when we see Nathaniel approaching Jesus, Jesus simply says, declares, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit or no guile, as it says in the King James. Now this reference to Nathaniel is startling. 
Nathaniel himself was surprised that Jesus seemed to know him so well, intimately, personally. How do you know me, he says. And Jesus answers, before Philip called you, I saw you and I saw you were under the fig tree. Now this is a display of a sort of divine foreknowledge. Something's gone on here that has convinced Nathaniel immediately and he immediately declares, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So here he's in, so to speak. And the passage shows us that all these four men now, Andrew, Peter, Philip and Nathaniel, have all and each concluded that Jesus is the Messiah. Andrew's and Peter's belief came through personal encounters with Jesus, one taking time at some depth, one more com immediate, and Philip and Nathaniel, they're convinced in a different way. They're convinced initially by the Jewish scriptures and seeing that Jesus Christ is fulfilled them. And Nathaniel has the add-on of him witnessing some sort of supernatural knowledge of Jesus. So this highlights that different types of individuals come through different paths and come to the same conclusion from Jesus's, uh, about Jesus' identity. The added detail given with Philip and Nathaniel in the second part is there to underscore, I think, the principle that if any person from a religious background, whether they be Jewish or of another faith, if they take the time to examine the Gospels meticulously and read Jesus' word and give them the same respect as they would approach any religious writings that in itself is enough to convince them can be enough to convince them with a receptive heart that Jesus is the Messiah and this highlights that these early disciples of Christ were Jewish in background and they initially viewed him wholly as the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures and that understanding I believe can still resonate with people today of a Jewish background and of other faiths and none now, I don't have time this morning to go into all the passages in the Old Testament that declare this, but I think it's worth highlighting three key points that absolutely positively, I would say dogmatically, demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and are useful for understanding in our conversations or approaches or interactions with people who have a background in that faith. First, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we are told that God would send a descendant of David to establish the kingdom. And both Jewish and Christian scholars both recognize that this is a reference to the Messiah, meaning that the Messiah who will come must be of the son of David. And that is widely accepted across all backgrounds to the point it's not really even debated. Second, in Micah, chapter 5 verse 2 the old testament tells us that the messiah would be born in bethlehem we hear it say you o bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of judah out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over israel whose origins are from old from ancient times so the verse is plainly straightforwardly saying the messiah will be born in bethlehem and have eternal origins and that's the key and we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then thirdly, in Daniel chapter 9, the great prophetic passage in the Old Testament tells us that when the Messiah arrives, it says in verse 26, after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. And this passage actually provides a timeline for the Messiah's coming when analyzed in detail, and that it can be seen to align with the time of Jesus. The New Testament declares that Jesus is the son of David, confirms it in the fact that he's born in Bethlehem, that he grew up in Nazareth, and that he arrived at the time, the very time prophesied by Daniel. And if you look at these Old Testament passages and many, many, many others, I would say you are absolutely driven to logically conclude that Jesus must be the Messiah. Now, Today, all we've done is consider the testimonies of these four very different first century Jewish men in this, revealed in this passage. Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. 
all of who concluded that Jesus is the Messiah by basically looking at the scriptures combined with encountering him personally. Some emphasize one aspect of it, some more the others. And what I will suggest to you that this, these principles still apply, apply today. And still today, there is sort of an official view of Jesus as represented by my Jewish friend in the introduction I talk about. And there is, of course, the personal one. Now, the official view often and always has rejected Jesus as the Messiah. However, that doesn't mean many individual Jewish people have not come to believe in him. Just like the priestly hierarchy of his day rejected Jesus and did so because he attracted people, he pulled people away from that religious worldview. You see, they, as today, they were focusing on religious minute observances of the law rather than considering things like the prophecies concerning the Messiah and more importantly, the fact that God wants us to have a personal relationship with him. So if you're of Jewish background, Muslim background, atheist background, or even a nominal Christian background, and you're not persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, I simply invite you to come and see for yourself. Look at him, examine his life, examine his words, and if you do that authentically, with an open-hearted approach, you may very well conclude that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, I know for some, particularly those of a religious background, that decision is a huge one and it can feel very isolating. But if you come from any of these aforementioned backgrounds, remember that you are not alone. Many believers will welcome you with open arms and you will discover that many believers today come from those disparate backgrounds. Most, in fact, do today. So my friend, whether you're Jewish or not, whether you're Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist or not, the fact is you need to examine and make a decision whether or not Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Saviour mentioned in the Bible. Because we need all of us to make a decision about that. And if you do that, I will tell you that you can discover that you can know him personally. So I simply invite you to take your Bible and learn how you can know him even today. Thanks for being with me. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll be back tomorrow and we're going to look at the first beginnings of chapter 12, a very famous passage where Jesus turns water into wine, but I'll be coming at it from a particularly unique angle, absolutely core to it, but absolutely missed by a lot of people, where Jesus confirms himself to people and what that really means. But anyway, thanks for being with me today. I do hope you find it helpful. And if you're here on a newbie, then why not consider subscribing to this podcast and you'll never miss, need never miss another single episode. That way you can make the decision to make the in-depth study of the Bible part of your everyday life. I'm here every week, Monday to Friday, with some bonus episodes, sometimes at weekends or between seasons, all of which aims to bring the the Word of God into it being part of your daily life. It's free to subscribe wherever you get the podcast from, but there are options that if you'd like to listen to an ad-free version of the podcast or have access to loads and loads, hours and hours of other teaching material around these subjects and secular subjects and where they intersect with Christian faith, I put all that stuff over on Patreon there. 
Follow me on Patreon, become part of that community without making a payment and you'll have access to the ad-free version. But some of the other stuff, people make a decision to make a small donation there for the extra bonus and exclusive materials I put over there. And it is thanks to those people doing that that this whole Bible Project podcast is able to, to happen. So thanks for listening. Thanks for being with me today. Take a look if you want. Uh, there should be an, in the episode notes a full transcript of everything I've said today as well as some uh, background notes. All of those things are free for you to use in whatever way you want. Copyright free, freely available in the public domain. Happy for you to use them in your personal life or your personal ministry. You don't need to credit this in doing it. I trust that God can use it to benefit you and the Christian community that you've been called to be part of. So that's it. Thanks for being with me today. I'll see you back here again tomorrow, I hope, on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.